Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Um, interesting question of the day, uh, I thought. So how did you spend your week off? Uh, catching up 12, a little over 12%, relaxing 30%, 58%, using the time to work on other classes. Um, I'm pleased with these results. I mean, it kind of tells me that I think it was a good idea for us to have that a bit of a pause. Uh, now you're all ready to move into uh, homework six and, and the, uh, the other two homeworks we'll be doing this quarter. Um, I, I wanted to say a couple of things about the baby names homework. So uh, as I said, I released it on Monday. Uh, the information is here. So um, there's a debugging hints uh, document that you could take a look at that tells you how to check to see what version of Java you're running. Some people who are running older versions of Java, like Java 8, uh, might have some problems matching our sample output. So you should be running at least Java 11. Uh, so anyway, the debugging hints tell you how to uh, check that, and uh, the uh, Java software tells you how to install a newer version of Java on your computer. Uh, there basically uh, seems like there are two main varieties that the Windows machines tend to match. So you'll see that there's a set of outputs that are labeled Windows 1 and a set of outputs that are labeled Windows 2. So you can match either of those. Doesn't you know, Obviously, you're not going to match both. So uh, it does seem to be somewhat of an even split between people who are matching the first one versus people who are matching the second one. Um, and there's a similar Mac 1 and Mac 2, although it seems like most people are matching Mac 1 if they have a Mac. In any event, you only need to match one of these sets of outputs. So there's four different outputs to match. Uh, and if you're having trouble matching output, check to see what version of Java you're running. If you're still having trouble, talk to your TA to try to figure out what's, what's going on. You also could take a look and have it highlight what's different in your output versus the sample output. These mismatches that we're getting are, have entirely to do with the fonts. So you would see that it's the text that's being highlighted. Uh, if it's one of these differences where, there, where it really is okay, but it, it, it's showing a pixel difference that's not a real pixel difference. If you see any problems with lines, for example, well then that's something you really do need to fix. That means that you uh, haven't yet uh, written the program correctly. Uh, but there are uh, differences uh, across different Java implementations and across different operating systems that lead to slightly different uh, fonts you know, being used there. Uh, so that's why the four different variations. Match any one of the four. That's kind of the, the moral of that story. Check your Java if you need to, work with your TA if you need to. All right, well, we're gonna be moving into material from chapter seven today. Um, it's going to be tempting, potentially, for you to wanna to use this for the baby names homework. You're not allowed to use this new material for baby names. As usual, everything you needed for baby names, we finished on Monday when we passed out the assignment. So we're gonna use this new material for, chap for homework seven. So uh, uh, anyway, we're, we wanna be looking at it, but it's not gonna be something that we'll be using just yet. So there's a sample program here uh, that's kind of a nice way of uh, motivating uh, why it is we might need this uh, uh, concept we're gonna be developing in chapter seven. So this is a program, you know, this is kind of like a, a typical, uh, you know, even chapter four style program. Uh, you know, that uh, asks for how many days temperature and it kind of prompts for a bunch of different temperatures and it computes an average. Uh, we can go ahead and run it and you can see. So suppose that I say that I want four days average temperatures, uh, 63, 68, 66, and we had like a, a 84 degree day over the weekend. So it says that the average is 70.25 and of, of those four days, so if I kind of asked you how many of those days were above average, we had one, you know, that 84 day that I have listed here uh, that's uh, way above average and uh, the other ones are, are not above average. So what if I wanted to print out in this program how many days were above average? So that's the task I want us to think about is kind of reporting how many days are above average. And again, it's disappointing that we can't have participation here because it's nice to get suggestions from students and so forth. Most people realize pretty quickly that, um, well, when you're, as you say when you're reading in these numbers, that what you'd you know, like to be able to do is something like this. If that next temperature is greater than the average, you know, then you would 
It's increment a counter, for example, you know, the, to count how many of those days are above average. Problem is that average isn't computed until here. So, you know, we can't have this in the loop here because we haven't computed an average yet. So you'd think, well, maybe we move this line of code before the for loop, but that's not going to work because you, you haven't examined any of the temperatures. I mean, you, you know, you can't know in advance that the average is going to turn out to be 70.25. You really do have to wait until here before you can figure out what that average is. So an if is the right idea, just not here. You know, that's not going to work out. So this is a case where what we're going to want to do is to compute it after. Uh, so uh, what I have in mind is that we're going to write a second loop, that we're going to look at the data a second time, and we're going to uh, figure out how many of those days were above average. So first, first loop, we'll get the numbers and compute an average. Second loop, we'll figure out how many of them were above average to be able to do that task. Um, we have a problem. You know, which is that, uh, how do we get the data a second time? You know, the data's gone. You know, we only stored one temperature at a time. We had a variable called next, you know, doing a cumulative sum. And we've said about cumulative sum that one of the nice things about it is you don't need to remember the individual numbers. You know, you just need to know the overall sum. Well, that's true for computing an average, but it's not com true for computing these individual whether these individual numbers are above average. We really do need to remember all those individual numbers along the way. Um, I think that actually about the best we can do here, I mean, I mentioned that for scanners, you could make a, you know, with a file scanner, you could make a second file scanner that would read the file a second time. So if it was all in a file, we could do that. But this is with the user, where we've kind of, you know, prompted for these. I mean, I guess what you could do is system.out.println, uh, um, could you enter those a second time? You know, you could kind of uh, hope that the user was willing to give you the numbers all over again and the exact same numbers that, he gave, that, that you got before. Uh, anyway, we're not going to do that. Uh, we want something else. And what, we, what we're going to do is to use uh, the concept from Chapter 7. So I, I wanted to introduce it here as a way to motivate it a little bit. We'll come back and fix this in a little bit. But I want to spend some time in interactions. Maybe, actually, I probably want this about here. Uh, so I want to talk about this concept from Chapter 7. Uh, this is the first example of what we would call a data structure that you're going to be working with. And in particular, it's a data structure known as an array. So uh, that's what we're doing here in Chapter 7. Uh, let me begin by just uh, uh, setting up an array. And then we'll talk about it from there. So what if I said that I wanted an uh, integer array that was 10 long and I'm calling it list? So let's see, let me scooch this over a little bit. I'm gonna drag out list, and JGRASP has a very nice viewer for this that lets me see uh, what this thing looks like. So what we've been doing in our programs is uh, if you wanted, like if you wanted to do those different temperatures, you'd have things like a temp one uh, and a temp two and a temp three. You know, that's what we did in the admissions program. That's what we did in the BMI program is we just had variables with names like that. But I mean, I, obviously you can see that's not gonna work, you know, for a large program. If you go in and open an account at a bank, they don't say, wait a minute, let me add another variable, you know? So uh, obviously we need to do something better than that. And that's what the array kind of allows us to do. So what I'm saying here is that I want to have 10 different ints. And what the picture is showing me here is that I've got kind of these different boxes, you know, each of which stores an int value. There are 10 of them. There's an indexing scheme so that the first one is indexed at zero. That means that the 10th one has index nine because we're starting at an index of zero. Uh, and I, there's lots of analogies that people use for this. Uh, like a, an obvious one is that it's a little bit like P.O. boxes. I mean, if you go to the post office, you see this whole row of uh, little P.O. boxes, you know, that people have. So you could think of this as being P.O. box zero, P.O. box one, P.O. box two, and so forth. So there's an indexing scheme. You know, you have a whole bunch of things that are in some sense all the same. All these boxes are equivalent to each other in some sense. They can store mail. Uh, but there's an indexing scheme, so you can put it in this mailbox or that mailbox or some other mailbox. So that's kind of the way arrays work. And arrays use uh, 
the bracket notation as a way of indicating, it's like which PO box are you interested in? Like if I said, let's set list bracket seven to be uh, 83. So I'm saying take the array element whose index is seven and I wanna set it to be an 83. So let me execute that line of code and you can see uh, JGRAS puts it in red to indicate uh, that it's changed uh, in value. All right, well, let me back up a little bit and say a few things that I didn't when I first put this uh, here. We're declaring a variable called list. We gave it a name. Nothing special about the name list that I've given here. I could have called it X. I could have called it anything I want to. You know, list seemed like a reasonable name to use. Whenever you declare a variable, you have to tell Java what type it is. And I've declared this variable to be of type int bracket bracket. What those empty brackets indicate uh, is that it is an array. You know, this is something, Java has special support for arrays. So they're kind of a built-in part of the language. They, they are in C and C++ as well. So programmers are very familiar with arrays. That's why Java has this kind of built-in array syntax that's very similar to what C and C++ do. And the idea is that it matters what kinds of values are stored in the array. This is an array whose individual values are of type int. We're gonna see variations in a minute where they're storing different kinds of values instead. But it turns out that all of the arrays that store int values are of the same type. This one happens to be an array that has 10 spaces in it, 10 different ints that it's combining. But you could have a, an array of ints that's 100 long, 50 long, two long, zero. You know, you can have int arrays of, of, uh, of many different lengths and they would all be considered to be of the same type in Java. They would all be considered to be of type int bracket bracket. So that's kind of the way we tend to say it if we're describing things, int bracket bracket list. So for the type, you don't include inside the brackets an indication of how big it is. But when you go to construct it, when we ask you know, for a call on new, then we do have to be specific. We can't just say, give me a generic integer array. It, when I'm constructing one, I have to choose a size. And so I've chosen a size of 10 here. All right, well, so that would be an integer array. So it turns out in Java that basically any type that Java knows about, so uh, double is a type that Java knows about. Uh, so you can have a type which would be double bracket bracket. So given a type that Java understands, you can always add bracket bracket to the end of the type, and that's a new type, which would be an array of such things. So this would be an array of doubles. Uh, and suppose I said I called this uh, results, which is gonna be a new uh, uh, array of doubles uh, that has, what did I wanna do for that? Uh, five long, I, I'm trying to match what's in the slides for today, so uh, with these examples. Let me uh, drag this one out. And so you can see this is an array of length five, uh, where these values now uh, are, all have a decimal point, 0, 0.0. They're all doubles instead of being ints. You may have noticed something, you know, about what's going on inside these arrays that Java is doing something that it doesn't normally do, which is that it's initializing the values inside the array. This is something that's called auto-initialization. So it's an important um, uh, uh, property of arrays that when you ask Java to construct one, when it constructs that array, it will set all of the elements of that array to the zero equivalent of the type. So different types kind of have a different notion of what zero would be. I mean, obviously for numerical types, zero is just numerical zero. Uh, but for example, what if I had a, oh, I wanted to be down here. What if I wanted a Boolean array called tests, which was gonna be a new Boolean array, say six long. What do you, what do you suppose the, the, uh, the zero equivalent for Boolean would be? Uh, most people figure this out that false, you know, I mean, it could be either, right? it doesn't really matter, but uh, by convention, we tend to think of false as being the zero equivalent for the type. So now I have a third array here that uh, has got uh, a bunch of values of false inside of it. 
So I have three different arrays storing three different kinds of data. Integer data, double data, Boolean data. Uh, you can have things of, of any of these different types. While I'm mentioning kind of the type idea, let me mention something briefly. This is not something that you have to understand as much immediately, but I'll just mention it. We know that string is a type in Java, so that means that string bracket bracket would be a type. Uh, that would be an array of strings. String bracket bracket, sound familiar? Public static void main string bracket bracket. Ah, you're starting to learn a little more about what that header for main involves. Main is being passed a string array. So now you know a little something more about main than you knew before. And I wanted to mention this other idea. This is something that we don't follow up on in 142 and not even really in 143. Uh, it's, it's too bad because actually it's, uh, there's a, some interesting applications for it. But so, you know, int is a type in Java, which means that int bracket bracket is a type because you put the brackets after the name of some legal type. So that is a legal type that would represent a, 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 like a row of ints. Uh, mathematicians would call that a vector, you know, a one-dimensional sequence of values. But since int bracket bracket is a legal type in Java, that means that we can put bracket bracket after it, and that's also a legal type in Java, int bracket 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 bracket. What that would be would be an array of int bracket brackets. So in other words, a two-dimensional structure, what the mathematicians would call a matrix or a grid, you know, so that we, we have a two-dimensional structure now where we have uh, uh, basically a bunch of, a bunch of rows uh, uh, to give us two dimensions. And since that's a type in Java, you could add bracket bracket to the end of that and have a three-dimensional structure. So this is what we call multi-dimensional arrays. There's some coverage of it in chapter seven, some discussion of it, so if you're all interested, you can read about it there. But as I said, it's not something that we're gonna be using uh, in the 142 class. Okay, uh, I wanna say a little bit about uh, the status of what you can do with something like a list bracket seven. So, cause you might wonder, I mean, we, we, it's not a simple name anymore. It's, in, it's not like what we were doing before. Uh, but let me mention this idea. Uh, what if we had an integer variable X? You know, so suppose I introduce an integer variable X. What are the kinds of things that you can do with it? Uh, well, you can initialize it, so you could set it to two. You can form expressions with X. So like you could form an expression two times X plus one. You could use that, say, in a println, or you could use that to assign a variable, or you know, in some call on a method or something, you could have a two times X plus one. So we can do things like that. We can write lines of code like X is equal to two times X, you know, which is gonna double the value of X. Or we can do X plus plus, you know, to do the incrementing. You know, which, uh, which we saw it setting it to two, doubling it to four, and then adding one to make it a five. Those are all things that you can do with an int variable like x. So I want to mention a very simple concept, you know, that, that, it, that is correct. Uh, it's a correct understanding of this. That if we had some element of the array, like suppose we were thinking about uh, list bracket two, for example. Uh, that element of the array. So list bracket two is a reference, you know, so it comes out of a, a complicated structure, but list bracket bracket two is a simple int. And it turns out that you can do anything with list bracket two that you can do with X. Anything you could do with a simple int, you could do with this element of the list array. So what were the things we did? Uh, we said things like we did an assigning, we, we assigned it to two, so you'll see the two appearing here, like we had the two appearing over here. We can form expressions like two times list bracket two plus one. So just like we did a two times x plus one, we could have two times list bracket two plus one, you know, which evaluates to a five. We said x equals two times x. We can say list bracket two equals two times list bracket two, you know, just substituting list bracket two for x and now it's doubled to be a four. We said x plus plus, so we can say list bracket two plus plus, uh, and it gets incremented to be a five. So it has a complicated name in a way because of the brackets, but down deep, or from Java's point of view, it's just a simple int. You know, so you can do, whatever you can do with a simple int, you could do with an element like list bracket two. I want to 
Ben, uh, normally I'd ask for questions, and it's always uh, there's always lots of interesting questions. You know, uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't have the ability to do that, so I just kind of have to move on. Um, what's going to turn out to be really interesting, and we'll see this in examples that we do today and in the next few lectures, is that uh, inside of the brackets, we have the ability to have an expression, not just something like list bracket two, you know, but uh, list bracket some expression in here that's going to be evaluated. That's going to turn out to be the really powerful thing about what we can do with an array. And I wanted to explore that a little bit with you um, by uh, showing you a specific thing. So uh, let me remind you, so we talked about, we talked about how to have uh, strings, you know, a string variable that refers to a string. And I'll ask people, do you remember how to ask Java how many characters the string has? It has length, uh, you can say s dot length paren paren. So you say to the string, hey string, what's your length? You know, it'll tell you I have a length of 11. You can talk to the string and ask it that. Well, arrays have something similar. So how would you ask an array how, how, how big it is, how, how, how many spaces there are in the array? And the logical thing, I would say, you know, or the, the thing that would make the language easier to work with is if it was list.length paren paren, you know, just like it is for strings, because then we'd learn one convention and it would work for both. It would work for both strings and arrays. This is a case where Java is showing a bit of ugliness. Uh, that's not how they did it. And it's interesting because this goes all the way back to the beginning of Java. Java from the very beginning had arrays and strings. So they knew about this at the time and they kind of decided that they, they wanted to have, they were willing to live with a certain inconsistency. So you do ask for the length of an array, but you don't use the bracket, uh, the parens. You don't, you don't say paren paren. So in the case of an array, you ask for the dot length without parentheses. And so it'll tell us that that's length is 10. We could ask the results array, what's your length? And we could ask the tests array, what's your length? So for any array, you can ask it how big it is by asking for its dot length. Uh, students will sometimes say, why this inconsistency in Java? Uh, I mean, Java is a practical programming language, a real industrial programming language. They weren't, you know, thinking about how to make things particularly easy for novices. You know, the, the, there, there might have been things where they didn't actually think through how this was going to turn out. There, there are, I, I, I'm convinced that it's because they were obsessed with trying to have array-based code run really fast. And that's why they decided to have this inconsistency. Anyway, uh, we have to live with it. Uh, if you use Python, you'll find that Python doesn't have an inconsistency for this kind of thing, but Java does. So uh, array.length is the way we would figure this out. So if you had something like the list array, what, how would I access the last element of the array? Well, it's element nine, right? So I could say list nine, I could set it to a 14, and we see that being set to a 14. But how could I refer to the last element of the array uh, in a more generic way that would work no matter what the, what the size of the array was? So that's a question I normally ask people. So we want to take into account the list.length. But we can't just use list.length because list.length is 10. You know, with the zero based indexing, you know, the highest index is going to be index 9. So we have to account for that zero base, you know, the fact that it starts at zero somehow. We, there's a phrase we use with, uh, with uh, array programming often, what we call an off by one bug. Uh, oh, Bob, off by one bug. And so that's what we would have here is that this would be an oh, Bob, an off by one bug. Uh, we don't want list.length, we want list.length minus one, one less than list.length. And we can put that expression inside of the brackets and Java will evaluate that expression, see that it, it evaluates to a nine, and then if we set this to a 42, you know, we've put a 42 right here. And similarly, if we said results of results.length minus one uh, is set to 17.3, we put a 17.3 at the end right there. And if we said tests of tests.length minus one is assigned to true, then we put a true in the last element there. So uh, asking for the length minus one element of an array gets you the last one. 
a, a more uh, challenging uh, task would be to figure out how to find the middle element. So uh, if we look at this results array, for example, the middle one is this one that's at index two. So how would I do, res I mean, I can say results of two, obviously, you know, but that's not gonna work when I have a different size to the array. Why is it two? Why is that in the middle? Uh, that particular array has a length of five. So where does the two come from with a length of five? So I normally ask the audience and I, I always get someone who's able to, to recognize, well, there's lots of different kinds of answers that I'll get from people, but uh, it relates to the length uh, divided by two you know, half the length, because that's the, the midpoint, right? It's gonna be half, uh, although we'll see it's a little trickier than just that. But, uh, so the length is five. Five divided by two would give us two and a half, but remember, integer division of five by two gives us two, you know? So it turns out that, that gives us the right answer in this case. So if I say results of results dot length over two, that's the expression I'm using inside the brackets as results, oops, I didn't do that quite right. Uh, results dot length over two is the expression that I'm value, evaluating inside the, the brackets. I can set that to be 3.4, uh, and there you see that got set to 3.4, the middle value. If I try doing that on something like the tests array, so if I say tests of tests dot length over two, so the same kind of idea, divide the length by two, if I set that to be true, what it does is it sets this element to be true. The thing is, this one has six elements. So in a way, it kind of has two middles. Uh, index two and index three are both in the middle. That's true uh, of the lists, uh, uh, list uh, array as well, because it has an even length. So there's kind of you know, two middles. What if I wanted to get the, the leftmost middle? Not the, right, not the later middle, but the earlier middle instead. What kind of an expression could I use for that? And people sometimes think to say that I could use something like that and then I could do say minus one. And that's true, that, I mean it's correct that it would get me uh, the, the index two in this case, but then what it's gonna get me over here is it's gonna get me looking at index one here. So it's a little trickier than just subtracting one from it. There's a lot of things you could do. It has to do with odd even. So you could have an if, you know, you could use mod two. There's a lot of things to do. Uh, I usually get someone who's able to come up with an expression. Uh, I sometimes wonder whether that's maybe people who've done uh, array programming before. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, that some people are kind of able to figure this out that, that when we had this length of five here that we divided by two, uh, in a way, the fact that we had a five, five was, you know, to, to divide by two, it was bigger than it needed to be, right? Because uh, that kind of gave a two and a half where we chopped off the 0.5. So if we, if we had a length that was the five, you know, divided by, uh, by two, oops, this isn't what I wanted to do. What I, what I wanted to do was to keep the divided by two, but what I want to do is a minus one here. So I'm kind of having trouble coming up with my own example. Let's take a look, let's see, you know, uh, let's see what this does. So when we have a length of six, test.length is six, minus one is five, and then when you subtract, you know, then when you divide that by two, uh, you're gonna get an, an index of two. So that's the index we were looking for. So, and I'll show you if we kind of run that, it sets the leftmost one. Uh, but if I then go to results of, oops, not, not this, results of results.length minus one over two. So what it's gonna do in that case is that this length is a five, five minus one is four, four divided by two still gives me a two. So if I set this say to 1.3, it's still getting me the middle one here. So that's kind of an approach that works in both of those cases. It's a somewhat clever expression. So if you, if you don't see exactly how, you know, if, if, if you didn't come up with that or if it seems a little bit weird to come up with that, don't worry about it. Uh, this would have been a perfectly fine case to use an if else, for example, looking at the, the mod two. But, uh, you know, it's not bad to know that you could have a, a, an expression that would work uh, in, in both of the different cases, the odd and the even case. 
All right, I want to say just uh, one more thing that I wanted to mention. So this list array that I had here, you know, we know that we have uh, indexes zero through nine. What if we referred to index minus three and we set it to be a 12, for example? We get a, a, an array index out of bounds exception. When you write code involving arrays, you're likely to get this a lot. You know, that you run your code and you get an array index out of bounds exception. Probably uh, you know, it'll really be bothering you uh, by the time you're done with homework seven, you know, that it, you, it, 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 it's upsetting to get an array index out of bounds exception. It means you've got, an, got something inside the brackets there that evaluated to an illegal index. Uh, it gives you some useful feedback it tells you that that index was negative three, and it tells you that it's negative. So it's letting you know that's why that didn't work out. That's, so pay attention not just to the fact that you get an array index out of bounds exception, but also this extra information. Uh, and of course, it'll tell you what line of code it was in where that happened. Um, if we, uh, at, uh, when you run it in the normal Java mode, when you're running a program, um, we know that we can say list bracket nine to get the, the last element, uh, but list bracket 10, even though it has a length of 10, there is no element 10. And so if I say list bracket 10 is a 12, I, I get an array index out of bounds exception on the other side. So Java is very strict about this. You're only allowed to use the legal indexes, nothing outside of the range of the legal indexes. And here what it says is again telling you what your illegal index was, which is a 10. And it's saying that it's greater than or equal to the array size of 10. So again, useful information that it's giving you uh, that you should pay attention to when you encounter an error like that. Okay, well that was a bunch of uh, uh, sample uh, executions, uh, I mean, a sample uh, exploration of arrays. Let's go back and finish up this program that we wrote before. So what are we gonna do in this program? Instead of having a variable next, where we're gonna keep overwriting, overwriting, overwriting what we had, we're gonna to wanna to remember all of these different temperatures that we see. So the idea would be to introduce an integer uh, array that I'll call temps, which is a new integer array, and how big do I want it to be? Well, I asked the user how many days temperatures and read that in, so I can use that to know how many, how many days temperatures to have. And then inside my loop, I'm not going to be uh, using a variable called next. Well, actually, let me, let me do this part of it a uh, second. Let me, let, me, let me do this loop down here first, because I want to talk about some general things about arrays. So in chapter seven, I introduce what I call the uh, standard array traversal. Traversal means to, to go through, you kind of uh, uh, visit each of the different values within the array, examine each of the different values in the array. So there is kind of a standard loop that we use for this that you, you will learn by the time you've practiced arrays enough. Uh, it's almost something that, I mean, the programmers have done this a lot, they just kind of they, they regurgitate this off the top of their head. For an integer variable i starting at zero, and then I've got an array here called temps, so I'm gonna say i less than temps.length, i plus plus, and inside of my loop, I'm gonna say do something, do something with temps bracket i. So the lowest index is zero, that's why I have an indexing variable i that starts at zero. Uh, I don't wanna go all the way up to the length because it starts at zero, that's why I go strictly less than the length, that's why it'll go up to but not including the length with an i plus plus. And inside my loop, you know, that i is indexing the different values of the array, so I'd want to be doing something with temps zero, temps one, temps two, temps three, and so forth. So this is a standard loop. Not every loop matches this pattern, but a lot of them do, or there's some variation of this. So it's not a bad idea to kind of get used to the standard loop and to use that often as a kind of a starting point. So what would we do inside of here? Uh, we said that there'd be some kind of an if. So if temperatures of I is greater than average, so if that's an above average temperature, then, and we were supposed to count them, count how many there are. So we could do a counter plus plus. That means we're gonna need to introduce an int count that we start at zero here. So we count how many of them are above average, and that would allow us 
after the loop to be able to say system.out.println uh, count days above average. So we'll be able to report how many, day, how many of those temperatures were above the average temperatures. All right, so again, this is kind of our standard uh, array traversal loop. Um, I'm going to make a copy of this uh, version of the loop that we had before, and I'm going to just kind of comment that out for, for right now uh, because I want to rewrite it. So I'm going to change it to the standard array traversal. For int i starting at 0, i strictly less than uh, temps.length, i++, plus plus, and then I want to do something with temps bracket i inside the loop. Well, what is it that I want to do with it? I want to give it a value by reading something in from the console. So instead of having this local variable called next, I'm going to say temps bracket i. I'm going, to, I'm going to read it into the next spot in the array, and uh, I'm also then going to want to use that here, temps bracket i, I'll add into my sum. Um, I, I use days here. I could have used days here if I wanted to because you notice that we set up the array to have the same you know, length as the, as the number of days. Kind of doesn't matter whether, which of those you used. You get the same result either way. I thought it was kind of nice to switch it to the more standard array version of the loop. But, but days would have been a fine thing to use, but strictly less than, not less than or equal to because we started at zero. All right, well, let's see what we get with this version of it. So let's compile and run this version of it. Uh, say four days temperatures, what did I do before? I don't quite remember, 63, 65, uh, 67, and, a, and an 84. Uh, and it says one day's above average. We could try to fix it so it said one day above average. I'm not gonna worry about that. I'm, I'm okay with it saying one day is above average computer and average temperature and said that. It's looking pretty good. I mean, the only thing that's not very good is that it says day zero, you know, and day one. Whereas it used to, you know, that's, that's because the, the loop is now starting at zero. So you could kind of think, well, how do I, I mean, do I, is that, an, is that a bug or do I just kind of tell the user that's just what you do if you want four days temperatures, days are, are numbered starting at zero? I mean. Computer programmers tend to think that way. Computer scientists often are comfortable with things starting with a zero, but most people find that weird. So, you know, there's no reason that you can't keep the loop the way you want it to be, but then instead of, you know, reporting uh, day zero, we'd, we'd uh, add a, a one to it every time so that we can, we can uh, let the user think of it as day one, two, three, four, uh, even though uh, we're gonna be uh, uh, entering it into our array uh, at indexes 0 through 3 for, uh, there we got day 1, 63, 64, 68, and 84. Uh, so I gave slightly different numbers, but that's fine. So uh, now we've got the day 1, 2, 3, 4. So uh, this is a good example to study as a, as a kind of a first example for arrays. I will put the complete program on the calendar for today. It's also discussed uh, in the slides. All right, well, let me switch gears a little bit, and uh, I'm going to do another example that's out of the slides. Uh, I want to use the array in a different kind of way than, uh, than the other program did. So this one, you know, I mean, the array was useful so that we could remember the temperatures, but in a way, uh, it was still solving a kind of problem that, uh, that doesn't, always require an array, you know, that an array is in some sense is more powerful than, than, uh, than what we saw in that program. Uh, there's this notion of what I would call sequential access, not just me, I should say it's a technical term, sequential access. So sequential access is kind of going through a series of values from beginning to end, the first one, the second one, the third one, the fourth one, you know, kind of going through a sequence. And it's true that we went through this sequence twice but it still was a sequential kind of access that we did. There's another kind of access that we call random access. 
where you can jump around within uh, some set of data, where you're not limited to just kind of go sequentially from beginning to end, but you can randomly jump around from one to the other. And arrays allow you to do random access. And so, you know, files are clearly sequential access. We, get, we, we, we read a first line, a second line, a third line, a fourth line, but arrays kind of allow random access, which is a more powerful kind of thing to be able to do. Uh, an analogy that I think of for this is when I was younger, I had something called a cassette tape player. So I would put a tape into my cassette player and I would hit play and I'd find it's the beginning of the tape and I want the sixth song on the tape. So I would have to hit this button called fast forward, you know, and it would go, you know, I'd wait a while, you know, and then hit play again and see if I'm at the right spot. If not, I you know, fast forward some more, you know, maybe I play and I've gone too far, so I hit this rewind button, that kind of goes backwards. I have to sequentially get to the right spot and then hit play. That's one of the reasons why when CD players came out, we were very interested because they allowed random access. You can go to the seventh song and then the first song and then the twelfth song and then the fourth song, so you can jump around uh, within uh, a recording like that. That's the random access versus the sequential. I think it's probably not a coincidence that once we started, once CDs started becoming popular, and you'd see there were then settings like randomize that would randomly go through the songs on an album, the, there was less effort by uh, musicians to do, to think about the album. I mean, if you, uh, if you look in the 70s, there were some really fantastic albums. Pink Floyd, for example, they really thought about what should be the first song, the second song, the third song. So they were, the, sequence, the sequence mattered to them a lot. I mean, it, it became less and less important uh, as people probably were using the sequential access la less. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> the, the era of great albums uh, was probably the 1970s. Um, so uh, what I want to do here is I want to kind of go through this uh, number. I want to pull it apart digit by digit, and I want to count how many of each digit there are, how many zeros, how many ones, how many twos, how many threes. So uh, you'll remember that I talked about this uh, when I was talking about problems that, that were like what would be on the midterm. I think it was a week ago, Monday, we were talking about this, and uh, I said that to pull a number apart digit by digit, you can say while the num is greater than zero, we'll get a digit by doing num mod 10. That gets the final digit, like the seven. Uh, and then we would reset num to be num divided by 10. So we chop off the last digit. So we use division by 10 and mod 10 to get the final digit. And then what do we want to do with that? So in this case, the first digit we'll get is a seven and then a zero and then a zero and then a one. So uh, in the olden days, before we knew how to use arrays, you would say things like, if the digit is equal to zero, then let's set uh, count zero plus plus, you know, uh, else if digit is equal equal to one, count one plus plus, you know, and we'd have a count for zeros and a count for ones and so forth. That's not what we're gonna do here. We're going to have an integer array for the counts. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to have an integer array that I'll call count, uh, which is set to a new integer array. And how many different digits are there? Well, there's 10 different digits, right? Zero through nine. So uh, I'm not going to be incrementing count bracket zero. I mean, count, uh, count zero. I'm going to, like a named variable count zero. I'm going to use the bracket notation. So this would be like setting element zero, element one but I don't have to do anything this tedious. I don't have to be saying if it's a zero, put the zero inside the brackets. If it's a one, put a one inside the brackets. I mean, if I know that whatever, whatever it is, whatever that digit is, it's that digit that I wanna put inside the brackets, I can just say count of digit is the one that I wanna be changing. So whatever value digit happens to have, that's what I wanna to use to index my array. That's the counter I wanna change. And what do I wanna do with the counter? I want to increment it. I want to do a plus plus. So we can get rid of all of that and just do a count of digit plus plus. Let me compile that. Uh, what did I, oh, I didn't finish out. I needed to have a right curly brace for my while loop. Uh, so let's compile that. 
And let me set a stop right here. Oop, I wanted to be using the stop sign instead. And let's do the debug option. And let's drag count out so that we can be watching what's going on here. I'll just use a, show you a few examples here. So uh, we are uh, going to enter the loop because num is greater than zero. We figure out that uh, the first digit, of the, you know, this is the trailing digit of the number, is a seven. And then we reset num to chop off the seven. So there the number ends in seven, but you'll see that when we execute the next line of code, the seven is kind of chopped off. And we're going to go to count element seven. So we're going to go to index seven. This is the counter that's going to be incremented. Watch there when I hit the kind of the step button, and you'll see that that got incremented to one. We come back around the loop, and now the final digit is a zero. So it's going to compute that the digit is a zero. It chops off that final zero from the end. And so it's going to go to count bracket zero, index zero. This is the counter that's going to be incremented. So it goes up by one. Notice we jumped around. We went from seven down to zero. We would come back around the loop and compute another digit of zero. So once again, we increment this counter by one. And now it's got a count of two. We could keep going, keep going. So anyway, uh, uh, this is something, if you were interested, you could, you could debug it a little further. But I, I think you get the idea. Well, I want to use this counting idea to solve a problem that I think you might find uh, interesting. Um, I don't know if we'll have time to do the whole thing, but we'll at least be able to get it started. What I did is I added up people's homework scores. What did you get on homeworks one through five? And so uh, this, th I just made a file. This is for our class, kind of how many homework points various people have. And so if you want to kind of know more about input like that, it's useful to create what we would call a histogram, kind of a graphical representation of how many people had each of those different scores. And uh, so we're going to have some kind of a loop that's going to go through and say, while the input has a next int, we're going to be processing this next int. And we're going to want to have something similar to what I had in that other program, where we're going to have an integer array that keeps track of counts counts. How many people got a score of 82? How many people got a score of 8? You know, that's what we want to keep track of. So I want a new integer array. And how big should it be? Well, what's the highest homework score? Uh, you may remember the first homework was worth 10. The second homework was worth 16. So it turns out the highest homework score is 86. But remember, it's zero based. There are actually 87 possible uh, homework scores. And zero is a possibility. It may be that somebody had a, had a score of zero. So 87 is how big we'd want this to be. And what is it we want to do inside of here? We want to do an input.nextint you know, uh, to basically get a next value. How about if I store that in a variable? How about if I say uh, int score is equal to input.next? Turns out that I don't need it, but I think it's, uh, it's helpful in this case to give a name to this little variable. So we read in the next score, and then what is it I want to do? Well, if, uh, you know, if you look at that file, what I'm going to want to do is uh, I'm going to want to increment the count for 24, then increment the count for 84, then increment the count for 76. I want to jump around that random access way. I want to be dealing with count bracket score that particular element of the count array, and I want to increment it by one because I've seen another one of that count, I mean, of that score. And then afterwards, I want to do something like this. For int i equals zero, i less than uh, count dot length, oops, dot length, uh, i plus plus, and not count all dot length, count dot length, uh, and uh, oops, what I want to do inside of here, I plus plus. And what I want to do inside of here is that I want to uh, say if count of I is greater than zero. So I'm not going to print out things for when, when there's nobody who got that score. Uh, I'm going to do a system.out.print of the I, the score, plus a colon. Uh, and then I'm going to have a for int, uh, uh, int J equals zero. Oh, let's do it the way we did in chapter two. J equal one, J less than or equal to something or other, J plus plus, system.out.print a star. So I'm just going to print a bunch of stars on a line 
one for each person who got that score and system.out.println. So that's kind of the basic histogram approach is that for each different score, and I'm choosing to only show the ones where there was a non-zero count, I'm gonna print out a number of stars on the line for however many people got that score. So what do I put here? A lot of things you could imagine. Uh, let me give a wrong answer of putting an I there, you know, kind of the, the uh, outer I. So if I compile, and what did I do wrong? Ah, uh, class interface or enum expected. Oh, I got an extra curly brace, I believe. So let's go ahead and compile. And let me scooch it up, and it will run it. And you see, I mean, what it's showing me is uh, two stars for two, five stars for five, seven stars for seven, eight stars. I mean, that's not what I want. I don't want I stars. How many stars do I want? I want count bracket I. This, this is gonna be something that takes a while to get used to, is kind of when to use the index I and when to use the array element count bracket I. So this is what the real histogram looks like. So this is, there were some people with kind of scores on the lower end of things, uh, and then you know, some people in the middle, and a, fair, and a little cluster of people who are at the high end. Uh, I'll put this on the calendar for today, too, if you're interested. I'm going to put a version of it uh, that is a little more sophisticated, called histogram here, uh, and I'm just going to go ahead and run it. It does an added thing, which is that it shows you a little drawing panel version of the histogram. So what I find interesting is that within one lecture, we were able to kind of learn enough about arrays to be able to solve a problem that I think you find interesting, to see this visualization of the histogram of homework scores for students in the class. All right, we'll do more next time.